Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Adam and Chris Show. I'm St. Adam. I'm Chris Malice. And we are here today to talk about Joel Schumacher, a controversial filmmaker, I guess you could say, depending on where you stand. Controversial, um, not in the Quentin Tarantino, Martin Scorsese, well, you know, not right. that his subject matter was controversial, just some of the quality of his films were. Right. I'm mean, Joel Schumacher has made some great movies. Unfortunately, when you name Joel Schumacher as a director, people tend to think of his Batman films, which, you know, my opinion, Chris's opinion, they Internet's really weren't. Opinion. They, you go online. They were, what? You go online. It's pretty much the whole collective Internet's movie. Their, their opinion. They were terrible. Well, they're, they are the movies that drove Michael Keaton away from the role and yeah. gave us Val Kilmer. Yeah, and George Clooney. Who is worse? That's a subject no, matter I'm, for another video. I would say Kilmer is worse. Clooney wasn't given much to work with because most of that film focused on Robin and Batgirl. Yeah. Kilmer was front and center, and but yeah, you're right. That's a that's a topic for another film. Yeah. Um. So, we are here to talk about Schumacher's good films. People tend to forget. He has a lot of good films, a lot of cult classics, a lot of, you know, films that have made their way into pop culture. And yep. today, we're going to go over them. So, let's, let's say a top seven list, because we haven't seen all, all of his films, uh, but these are, his, in our opinion, his seven most iconic so and Chris is going to introduce each and every one of them. Oh, okay. All right. So we'll start off with uh, number seven, Saint Elmo's Fire. Uh, it's his movie he made that your mom loves. Uh, if your uh, mother was uh, in their twenties or thirties in the eighties, along with The Big Chill, they probably watched Saint uh, Saint Elmo's Fire. I only heard about it from my mom. Move it on to the next spawn, one. Uh, it did spawn a very big. Um, radio hit with the title track saying on those fire yeah I can't tell you who sang it I could look it up but <laughs> I, I don't care enough to all right uh, number six phone booth with um, uh, Colin Farrell Colin and Farrell. Kiefer Sutherland um, who name will pop up a lot during this oh yeah definitely Kiefer definitely Kiefer yeah <clears throat> um, no, no. Phone Booth, I thought, was a great film. Such a simple concept. Probably didn't cost a whole lot to shoot. Just a man, played by Colin Farrell, trapped in a phone booth with a sniper on the other end of the phone. He doesn't yep. know which direction he's in. He has no idea how long this guy plans on keeping him there. He, he tends to mess with him psychologically, getting him to admit things and playing a lot of mind games with him. Um, earlier in the film, Colin Farrell is attacked by for lack of a better term, a pimp. Yeah. And the sniper, played by Kiefer Sutherland, who mostly, you only see one glimpse of him physically. He's really just this, this presence on the phone, but he does great at being this menacing presence on the phone. And he kills the pimp, and then the cops think Colin Farrell did it. So Colin Farrell's really screwed in this film. He's got, a, he's got all kinds of guns pointing at him the cops and the sniper. The sniper won't let him explain to the cops what happened. The cops think he's armed and dangerous. It's a great setup. Yeah. Um, it, 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 I, they think the thing that got that hurt that film was the fact that it was released. Um, it was going to be released right when the, the, DC, was the DC sniper had been um, out and about, and they didn't want to release it at that time. So they put off releasing it. And of course, it got negative buzz for it. But it's a good film. Um, uh, number five, we have The Client. Susan Sarandon, some kid who later uh, was in App Pupil, which is a good movie. And Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> so it's a, it's a movie about a kid that uh, witnesses a mob boss uh, kill himself. And um, he's going to testify, but he eventually get Susan Sarandon to be his uh, lawyer. Um, I think he like only pays her like only a handful of money 
and they have a bonding issue, like a like a protective mother or son kind of bond that develops. Um, good movie. Um, believe Tom Tommy Lee Jones is in it. Um, it was one of the. Huh. I said, you believe Tommy Lee Jones? It's been years since I've seen it. Uh, it <laughs> it's one of the, it's it's one of the movies that uh, that started with um because I think uh, uh, Schumacher did like two or three of these John Grisham movies. Um, so this was this is one of the big ones. And um, now now we got the movies that your parents love. We want to talk about the well, well hold on before before we move on i do want to say it is a nice setup with the, with the client because the kid i believe because i remember seeing that film in theaters he was kind of a troubled kid so a yeah. lot of people thought he was lying it's like susan sarandon became like really the only one that believed him and, yeah. and worked with him now it was weird watching that because growing up everyone said my mom looked like Susan Sarandon. Yeah. So it just made that film a little weirder to get. But I mean, they say two things you never work with in Hollywood are kids and animals. And Schumacher really managed to get a good performance out of this kid. I'm not saying the kid was like new to acting. Well, but I, I, I think that kid was later in a uh, half people with uh, Ian McKellum. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think he died of, uh, couple years ago which is sad because he's not a bad actor he just got the worst case of being a hollywood child star so <clears throat> but continue well that is just throwing that in there that's what made it weird for me to watch mm -hmm. um but but thanks for ending that that part of the list on a bummer oh well, well there's more bummers don't worry but uh, um, i i think I think the, 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 the number one movie is not that big of a bummer, or at least ends positively. It deals with dark material, but we'll move forward. At number four, Flatliners. This is uh, my second favorite Schumacher film. Um, it's about a group of medical students that decide to find a way to put themselves down, uh, to, to, to pseudo kill themselves for a short period of for a short period of time um, so they can see what happens in the aftermath. Well, what ends up happening after each one of these people do that is like the ghosts of people that they hurt end up coming back and confronting them. They start having like these visions of, you know, either ghosts or something like that. So Julia Roberts, she's in it. Keith Sutherland, of course, again, we start to see that pattern with uh, Schumacher. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Oliver Platt, Kevin Bacon, I believe, and I think one of the Baldwin brothers, the the more pretty boy, less actory, William Baldwin, I think. Uh, so one guy uh, films him banging chicks, and he starts having these uh, visions of him being constantly watched. Um, Julie Roberts feels like she's responsible for her dad's suicide, so he haunts her. But the well, what what you got is an ensemble flick. Yes, it's a you know, great a lot of these people, Yeah, with a lot of people that if they weren't big names at the time, they were getting ready to become big names. They're yeah. right there on the cusp. And Schumacher was able to bring them all together and get them, you know, get great performances out of them and get everything to flow very evenly. Yeah. I think the standout one, though, which will lead into other Schumacher films, was uh, Kiefer. Uh, he played a guy who, as a kid, was bullying some kid who ran up a tree to hide from him and his friends that were throwing rocks at him and they threw a rock at the kid and the kid fell from the tree and died. The, the kid's ghost ends up haunting him. And basically if you go and apologize, you can find a way to that guilt be gone, that, that, that spirit, like that entity to quit messing with you. Well, what do you do when they're dead? With uh, Julia Roberts and Kiefer Sutherland, they asked that question. And other people, there were people that they heard or whatever were alive. It was like a spirit entity. So, Flatliners, it's my second favorite Schumacher film. We're going to go into three. This is probably our, our most popular one, is uh, Lost Boys. Which is my second favorite Schumacher film. Yeah. Which, again, <laughs> guess who's in it? Keith Sutherland in the there lead bad go. guy role. And I don't give a shit about the ending. He was the lead villain. I don't care. 
he took way more screen time than what's her name's fucking boyfriend. Okay. That was cute at the end, but Kiefer was the main villain. <laughs> I don't give a shit. <clears throat> well, you know, they, they did have both Corey's in this film. Mm-hmm. With uh, with Corey Feldman trying to do his best Wolverine or Christian Bale impression. Yeah, I, I um, wonder was Empire of the Sun out at that time? I honestly can't remember. Oh, <clears throat> I honestly can't remember. But you know, again, you had people in this film that were going to go on to become bigger stars. Except for Corey Feldman, I think he probably peaked around this time. And hey, and I hate to say it, uh, what's his name? The guy who played uh, David was it David Patrick, who later was in uh, Speed Two. Huh? Jason Patrick, but it was Jason Patrick, and yeah, he was in Speed Two. But let's not forget, he was also in a movie we really like, Narc. Yes, well, he's he's had good movies. He's Narc's really good. He's also in, um, I think he's in Rush. A movie about uh, two undercover cops that become drug addicts. Um, so that'd be like the sequel to Dark. <laughs> uh, it's a movie about. Uh, well, let's break down the uh, plot. It's a it's a movie about, of course, a mother who's moved to uh, San Diego with her two kids, and it's the murder yeah, cap- murder capital of the world, and the oldest son befriends this group of outcasts and surprise they're fucking vampires. Um, from then well, on. Right. And the younger brother meets up with these two kids at a comic book store called the frog brothers. That are vampire hunters. <laughs> that, that, I mean, just if your last name is frog, I guess you only have a couple options. Yeah. Hunt vampires, host a Muppet show. Yeah. Oh. But I mean, you got you got like a little humor in there, but you also got some great vampire effects. The oh, '80s, yeah. and I, I've said this a lot. There is no horror like '80s horror. Oh yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the '80s had a lot of practical effects. Unfortunately, we don't do a whole lot of that nowadays. So you really felt like there was something there, and they got really creative and really out there with it. But how about the one guy from this film that has a big fan following? For really no good reason. I don't know. I don't say no good reason, but it doesn't do anything in the film. That saxophone player. <laughs> Bump motherfucker. <laughs> he plays. Bodybuilding saxophone player, which they did a comic book spinoff, and he's a vampire hunter too. And I would pay to see that film. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. Where's this comic book spinoff at? at your it's local probably worth money, dude. Place. Probably got a bunch of goth girls get all wet. Look it up. I oh. mean, it, it, the, the concept of a vampire slaying bodybuilding saxophone player is something that must be explored. Yeah. But the Lost Boys, I mean, the Lost Boys is great. You know, they killed one half of Wild Stallions in this film. Yeah, yeah, they killed Ted. No, they killed Bill. Bill. They killed Alex Winter is one of the first vampires to die. Yeah. It's like right, right before he did Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Um, and he really didn't do a whole lot after Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Well, he well, went on to Ted he went on to become a producer, but mm-hmm. um, but but no, I mean like again, Schumacher built this world, and everything's very atmospheric. Everything has a very distinct look. It's not like you can watch this film and be like, oh, he's ripping this movie off or or that off. No, it's like everything comes off as original. Everything flows organically, and I, I love you know because it's called The Lost Boys. You got these teenage vampires and the, you know their whole motto is stay up all night sleep all day never age it's like a continuous party for them. yeah and and again Kiefer Sutherland is just you know his character David is just so irredeemable in this film and it's like this is the worst person to give this kind of power to yeah so it's a very yeah. good film um Schumacher really really hit it out of the park with this one. Yeah, he did. Um number two, another great one. Our our personal wait, wait, favorite. Let, let, let me guess. Let me guess. Um let's see, Michael Douglas. I'm I'm seeing Michael Douglas. So the game. That was that was I, I know, I know. Just 
Get that was on. another great director, one of my favorites. Uh, Get on with not it. Not one of his best movies, but. Get on with it. All right. Okay, number two, Falling Down. Uh, Michael Douglas goes crazy. Um, Michael Douglas's character is uh, stuck in traffic in L.A. His name is only defense. That's the only time, the only thing they call him. Um, and he just gets out of the car and then proceeds to walk through L.A. and go on a little bit of a vigilante rampage. And uh, It's a great concept. movie to watch if you're having a bad day, but I will say, going back and watching this film, he is kind of a racist in this, you know, when he goes into, like, the Korean store and goes on that rant about, you know, the, the Coke being too much and, you know, I can understand prices and whatnot, but then he's like, oh, you know, people come into this country. I'm like, dude, you're not Native American. Shut up. Um, I well, do like him. He, who's the one person he does kill, though? Well, he did kill the white supremacists. That was yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. The mm. white supremacist who happens to also be a homophobic. Yeah. Um, he also takes the piss out of that rich guy on the golf course. <laughs> now you're going to die wearing that funny hat. That but, I mean, yeah, he, he goes on basically this rampage across, um, across L.A. Some things are justified, others are not, but it is fun to see. And here's a guy that you know, it's not like this one bad day has made, made him this way. He has been this way for a while. Yeah, and all he wants to do is go see his daughter. Yeah, um, and you know the bad thing is there's a article I read saying that you know you can take Michael Douglas's character right now, and it's a you know it's a case of you know the angry white man syndrome. While I don't fully agree with that, I will say by the time that film's over, um, going back and watching it. I could see him, you know, I could probably predict who he's voting for. Well, I don't even think it, it that would have anything to do. At the end, he comes to the realization when he, when uh, him and Robert Duvall have the standoff, a um, little bit of spoiler alert, if, if nobody knows what happens, uh, he finally gets his daughter and you find out that her daughter, her mother was divorcing him and he goes to this end of this watery pier and he has a standoff with Robert Duvall, who's a more of an introvert uh, detective that's following him around. And in the end, Duvall says, you know, you're basically going to jail. And he's like, when did I become the bad guy? You know, I'm the bad guy. He, he, it, it, it finally hits him. And then that's when he does the suicide by cop. He reaches for a gun that was a squirt gun, you know. Um, I think it's, I think it's uh, Schumacher's best movie hands down. Uh, the character's great. Um, it's funny, with all the, I guess, angry white guy movies with, like, that kind of character, I don't see a lot of those types of people gravitating to that movie. Maybe it's like, that's a little too much me. I'd rather stick with the Joker. I don't wear face paint or, or taxi driver or something like that. I, I, gotta, I gotta hawk. I don't even do that. I, I don't know, but uh, it's a great film. Great film. And our number one, Time to Kill. One of my favorite movies, which I say is Schumacher's best film, because it's a hard film to watch. And I said this, you know, when we did the countdown of my top 10 favorite movies. It's a hard film to watch, but films should be hard to watch. They should challenge you. Schumacher does a lot of uncomfortable things in this film. And the way everything plays out, you could see this happening, I, you know. Like I think that with a with time to kill, or, or I'm sorry, that with um, falling down are probably the two movies of his that are most likely to happen. Yeah. And uh -oh. I could I could really see, um, you know, time to kill happening in today's day and age. But it does it does make you ask the question of what would I do had that been me? Now those that aren't familiar with what this movie is, Chris, take it away. Uh, two cousin fuckers find a young black girl, beat her, rape her, throw her off a bridge. And the father, played by Samuel L. Jackson, gets a machine gun and guns them the fuck down as they're going to trial because he doesn't think that they will, will um, uh, really see justice. Um, and then now he's on trial. Um, and it's based on 
So eventually, of course, now it's a racial thing. The Ku Klux Klan get involved. Everyone's tensions are heightened. Um, what do you think was like you know, the best moments from that movie? Well, and again, we, we covered this in my top 10 countdown. Um, obviously, the question of Samuel Jackson, did they deserve to die? Yes, I do. Um, you, can go with the ending. Hell. you can go with the ending where it's like, you know, where Matthew McConaughey, and I will say this, this is like a movie that was made in the early to mid 90s. McConaughey at that point in time was known for just being the pretty boy, just doing a lot of yeah. romantic comedies, which he still did after this film, but he, Schumacher got a really good performance out of him. Oh yeah. Well, there was a great ensemble cast. You had Kevin Spacey, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Sandra <laughs> Bullock. <laughs> Uh, Kiefer uh, Sutherland, again, Kiefer Sutherland. Again. playing one of the most irredeemable uh, characters you've ever seen in a film. Yeah. You have Oliver Platt's in it. Um, I mean, shit. There's a lot of people, even like a lot of actors that have become like character actors that you may not necessarily know their names, but mm. you see them in things. They're in here. The guard that got actually lost his leg when Samuel Jackson shot the two suspects. I can't remember for the life of me that actor's name uh, he, right now. He played Norman he is, Osborn in uh, Spider-Man. Yeah, in Amazing Spider-Man. But he, yeah, he's in a lot of different things. Um, and really good, even though he has a little small part. When they ask the him, parts. Well, right, but uh, it's, you know, you only see him, I think, that once in the film. But you know what he's that scene he's in is is really good. Mm -hmm. So well, let me let me recap that scene. So he of course loses his leg because of a bullet ricocheted and, and and hit his leg. So he lost his leg. And when he's asked by Matthew McConaughey if he would have done what Samuel Jackson did, he's like, absolutely. <laughs> As a father, yes, I would have. So that took the the I think the race lines on to, out of it and said this is what a father would do. Um, it right. has a very positive ending, though. So yeah, I do like, like, like so the ending, and again, spoilers if you haven't seen this film. The way the court case ends, you know, Kevin Spacey is the prosecutor, Matthew McConaughey is the defense attorney. And credit given, they could have made Spacey's character really irredeemable. You could have made him a racist. You could, he's just a yeah. guy just doing his job. So McConaughey's like, okay, this guy is a really good attorney, you know. He's and he is bringing up, you know, the facts of the case. He did kill two people, you know. He didn't even let them have their day in court. So how is Matthew McConaughey going to get Jackson out of this? And he sets up the scene of what Samuel Jackson's daughter went through. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. He has everyone close their eyes, and he's like being pretty detailed in it. And then he ends it. Now imagine that she was white. And just the look on Samuel Jackson's face when he said that, he's like, that's brilliant. And it does get him off off the trial. And then Keeper Sutherland gets arrested because, again, Guy plays a great villain. Yeah, but yeah. No villain has been more irredeemable that he has played than this character in this film. Uh, well, do you, do you remember his character in A Few Good Men? Do you remember his character in Eye for an Eye? Do I still stand by what I said? <laughs> yeah, th those are all pretty bad. Mm -hmm. So, but so there you have it, um, Chris. Anyone that's wondering, what was your thoughts? Because I do believe you did see this film, Joel Schumacher's Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, we did, we didn't put it on the list. It, it it's it's pretty good. Um, I it? wanted to keep the list more. I, I've I've, heard, I've never seen it. I've heard all kinds of different things from people really liking it to people downright hating it and everything in between so yeah it was all right um i wanted to pick some of his more iconic things the thing is i he gets a lot of shit online as a subpar film director but he's got a better track record than in mike Shyamalan, and Shyamalan doesn't get it nearly as much hate as schumacher does oh i, th I think he does i think Shyamalan he's starting gets... to no but, i think I mean, he's been getting it Shimon, his good movies are Sixth Sense. Nope. I still say it's good. Unbreakable. I, Unbreakable, I'll give you. Split. 
Yep. I didn't see the sequel to that. You don't need to. And he Schumacher has movie. has four or five more movies, like three or four move, more movies better than his. So, but that ends that list. Uh, hit us up, uh, leave a comment in the comment section. Yeah, I mean, really, if you think there was something that Schumacher did that we overlooked, let us know what it is and let us know why. Um, you know, just because he had two Batman films that, while Terrible. financially successful, critically weren't that good um doesn't mean everything he did is on par with that yeah so um well chris do you have anything you want to recommend joel schumacher related falling down hands down falling down with flatliners both those two <clears throat> i'm going to recommend a movie that's not on this list okay since we've named these films uh, you know, we've given you a list of films that we think are really good. Go back and watch Batman and Robin, and then you'll see the contrast. Mm. All right, on that well, note... Yeah, I'm not taking that back. On that note, that is the end of the video. <laughs> yeah, so be sure to follow us on social media. We're talking Facebook, we're talking Twitter, Instagram that we have up now. Um, from the Adam and Chris show, I'm St. Adam. I'm Chris Mellis. We'll see you guys later.